the start of a new century, Japan is on the moon. After 10 years of recession and bad news, a new generation wants to break with the country's conservative course and head in a new direction. A few years ago, not many Japanese politicians could windsurf. In Japan, people always did what had been done before. That was fine when the economy was growing, but now things are reversed and we can't carry on like that. They think they have to change how they play to face up to new competition. If you stick to conventional Japanese ways, you'll get left behind. If you have no individual ability, you don't have a chance, do you? Traditionally, we've been dependent, complacent, and ambiguous. When problems arose, we just postponed dealing with them. But we can't afford to do that anymore. To save Japan, they say national attitudes have to change. That the country's economy and closed political system have to open up. Japan's long slump has reached into every part of the country, hitting coastal communities and farms as much as factories and offices. Matsukawa Ura on the north coast lives by its fishing fleet. Each morning their catch is auctioned to buyers from industrial cities hundreds of miles away on the other side of Japan. Because all Japanese are spending less in the shops, fishermen now get lower prices and demand has fallen. The Kono family own their own boat. They worry whether their children will be able to carry on the family business. We usually catch fish like sole and bream. But consumers don't want expensive fish like that anymore. There isn't much money around. We used to be able to sell our fish at a good price. But with the burst of the bubble, fish prices went right down. Five hours from Tokyo, Matsukawa Ura never saw the wilder excesses of the bubble's rise. But it shared the national nightmare that followed the fall. As property and stock prices plummeted after 1990, the second richest country in the world went into economic freefall. After the crash, thousands of small businesses found they couldn't carry on as banks called in their loans. Unemployment rose to a record high as firms told loyal workers to go. Scandal and humiliation hit the country's most trusted institutions. The confidence that had risen with Japan's post-war wealth was replaced by growing despair. And if people expected their politicians to rescue them, they were disappointed. From the early 1990s, a succession of governments tried and failed to deal with the crisis. Instead of dealing with the recession's real causes, they simply did what they'd always done before, poured in cash for public works. The idea was to prime the economic pump and get people spending again. In a pork barrel frenzy, the cash was shared out to every part of the country, whether or not it was actually needed. 
the mountainous district of Fukushima got a major new airport. There were new concert halls and harbors, motorways and tunnels. Even Matsukawa Ura got a new bridge. In nine years, they spent over 400 billion pounds, the equivalent of 40 channel tunnels. You have to imagine roads built in areas where there are hardly any cars, or going through tunnels that can lead absolutely nowhere because on the other side is merely a bridge and the bridge goes straight into a granite wall of a mountain. You have to look at the way in which riverbeds are covered with concrete just to spend money. By 1999, they had run up a 900 billion pound deficit, but with no success in lifting the burden of recession. The government grew so desperate, it tried literally giving money away. They printed free coupons and sent 100 pounds worth to 35 million people to spend in the hope of reviving stricken businesses. But the scheme still didn't bring any pickup. People just spent the coupons and saved their own cash. Since he retired from teaching nine years ago, Kikua Watanabe has had the worries of all Japanese pensioners. With interest rates at a mere half a percent, he gets almost no returns on his savings. And he wasn't impressed by the giveaway coupons. The government wanted to boost the economy any way it could, but those coupons did absolutely nothing. From a political point of view, it was a poor, shoddy policy. They should have done better. By the end of the decade, there had been no less than nine government stimulus packages. But the shops stayed empty. The public were worried that even harder times might be ahead they still wouldn't go out and spend. It's been recently verified that the government supplied uh, actually coupon to people, and many people didn't use the coupon even. In other words, they've got money provided by, by even the government, and they don't still have something to buy. Um, do, do we want to buy more suits? You know, we have full of suits in the closet. Do we want to buy more shoes? Full of shoes in, in the house. More cars, enough cars, education. Kids are fed up with education. In these frugal times, one of the few retailing successes were 100 yen shops. Their attraction in the second richest country in the world was that nothing cost more than 60p. I look at flyers and do my shopping in the cheapest places. If a supermarket offers to refund the consumption tax, I always go there, and so do a lot of housewives. The offer might be only for a limited period, but in that short time, thousands of us go to do our shopping. When I see scenes like that, I really feel that we are in a recession. As the depression continued, it gave more and more ammunition to those who for years had criticized the whole system by which Japan was governed. From the politicians in parliament, to their big business cronies, to the bureaucrats in their ministries, the Japanese establishment had shared the same beliefs. Nowhere enshrined those values and attitudes better than Tokyo University. Each year, new entrants to the country's top educational institution were drafted into the elite circle which ran Japan. 
Japan was seen as a corporate state in which business interests came before consumers and bureaucrats knew best. Tokyo graduates were guaranteed top jobs in the largest companies and banks, the civil service, or in politics. If they aspired to politics, there was only one party that counted. The Liberal Democrats had presided over Japan's post-war miracle and held power for 48 years, sustained through a web of personal connections and nepotism. It was quite normal for a son to follow in his father's political footsteps. The father's privileges would be passed to the son, and so the family tradition carried on. But only the people at the top benefited from this system. It didn't help ordinary citizens like us. The Liberal Democrats were split into factions. Because candidates from several factions would stand for each seat at election time, they needed patrons with plenty of money and influence to win. Backroom fixers could make or break political careers. Prime ministers themselves were often no more than party placemen. In practice, real power was held not by parliament, but by bureaucrats. They controlled policies and even defended them in the diet. Tsutomu Hata was briefly prime minister in 1994. The bureaucrats also gained from our long-running one-party rule. They protected and secured their own positions. It wasn't easy either to break that tradition or to push it to one side. It would have taken great determination and force from a prime minister to achieve any reform. Frustrated by the Liberal Democrats' failure to reform, Ichiro Ozawa, one of its most influential backroom heavies, broke away with others to launch a new opposition party in 1993. I think the problem lies in the fact that Japanese society is too strongly regulated. Politicians, businessmen, bureaucrats, they're all closely linked right at the very top. Even before the recession, it was an outsider who made the most devastating analysis of how the country worked. In a best-selling book called The Enigma of Japanese Power, Karl von Wolfram concluded that no one was really in charge at all. Well, I pointed at what I thought and still think is a fundamental defect of the Japanese political system. And that is that there is no center of political accountability. So in other words, no person or group of people that are ultimately expected to worry about the fate of Japan. Each year, Japanese fishermen pray for their own part in Japan's prosperity at a traditional sea festival. For Matsukawa Ura, where the festival is to be held this year, it's a reminder of their old identity. One focus for that identity is the emperor. Today, he's coming to the town for the first time. With politicians discredited, the emperor is the one part of the old system still held in high regard. The pre-war national anthem is played in schools again, and the government has encouraged use of the national flag. Trying to capitalize on the imperial glow, they say the flag and anthem can reinforce what it means to be Japanese. At the quayside, the Kono family has been up since dawn, cleaning their boat and raising the festival flags in the emperor's honor. <laughs> They too are tired of old-style politicians and their closed world. It seems as though a handful of top politicians decide everything and try to control us all. 